Hi, I'm Charlie Montotriello with Blue Bear Flutes, our website bluebearflutes.com where you can find some of the latest and greatest Native American flutes made available for sale to you every day. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to share with you something I often get asked questions about, uh, which is the setup on my router table here and why it has these markings on it and what have you. Honestly, it's very easy, the reason it's set like it is, and I've never seen the need to say, by the way, this is what I do. Um, but uh, I've had so many people ask questions about it that I thought I might make a short little few minute video to kind of help you if you're uh, just becoming a beginner Native American flute maker and you want to make flutes out of wood uh, instead of out of something that's hollow already like PVC or river cane or weeds or whatever, you know, corn stalks, tobacco stalks. Um, so I'm going to show you the process here, which I've, I've shown in other videos, but like I said, I want to show you exactly why I have some lines on this thing here. So while you're looking at this, you see there's an arrow. That's actually the way that there is resistance. As this router bit turns this direction, there's resistance if I push this way. If I push this way, it'll cause the piece of wood to go pew, just like that. It makes that noise too. But, uh, but anyway, um, I've known this all of my life. I've actually told people this that were woodworkers and they were shocked to find out there's a right and a wrong way to push a piece of wood on a router table. Uh, it's more obvious when you're doing something in the middle of a piece of wood rather than on the side of a piece of wood. But even on the side, it'll tend to want to push the wood a certain way and it's best to push against the, the, the uh, I guess, friction instead of with it because if you push with it, it's going to probably cut your finger off. That in mind, um, so I put this line up here for a few other people so they can keep an eye on that. Uh, if you'll notice, I've also got some arrows like up and down. Don't worry about that. That's for, once again, for other people. I'm going to show you how to do this for yourself uh, so that you, uh, you know exactly where you're going and what you're doing. So basically, what I have here is a wooden guide that I mounted on my um, fence that is mounted on the router table so this wooden guide can actually come off and be replaced I just countersunk some carriage screws in there and bolted them to the other side of the, the guide there and uh, cut a little gap in it so it can suck some of the sawdust through of course it doesn't suck nearly half of it but it sucks some of it through um, the router bit this is very important too if you'll take a look up here at the measurements this kind of shows you that it is a quarter of an inch out. Okay, so I've got it set so that it's a quarter of an inch um, back behind really the edge of that router bit. So you see how that's set up there. When you set up your router table to make Native American flutes or any kind of flutes or anything hollow that you have to cut in two pieces and hollow out one half of it like this one and then you hollow another half and put it together, you need to know the width of your hollow portion. What do you want to make the width be? This one is three, or excuse me, seven eighths of an inch wide, okay? And <laughs> it's kind of a reason I tell you all this stuff. I'm going to show you in just a minute why this arrow is important but I'm also going to show you when it's not important. Uh, anyway, so we're going to make a cut that is 7 eighths of an inch wide. And just as a guide, I wrote on here, the router fence needs to be at a quarter of an inch. And the depth needs to be at 10.85 millimeters. Okay? This is for a G and F sharp flute. And really, you can make a low E on this as well if you're careful and have your pattern set up for such. Because it's so incredibly close that it, it does matter, but it's... It'll work this way. It's just better if you make your low E a little larger in diameter. So I'm going to set this up here, which is where I keep my guide so that I don't forget that I've got to run this one through twice. Uh, and also for other guides that I've got, uh, some of them show me what the depth is and the width is uh, when I have to run it through four times per piece. Uh, like on an A flute, for example, if an A flute is only three quarters of an inch in diameter in this three quarters inch round bit that I have here, which actually is a 3 8 radius. This is 3 quarters of an inch uh, wide or in diameter, but it's a 3 8 radius from the center out, uh, which is how they sell them today for whatever crazy reason. Um, I'm going to cut a 7 8 hole inside of this, uh, a track that is, that is 7 8 of an inch wide, 
and is half of that deep. So I've got it set up right now uh, to the quarter inch fence mark. And then you can figure this out for whatever size um, flute that you're making. If you're making one that's larger in diameter, it needs to be wider, obviously. You just have to figure out how much of it's cutting off of this edge here um, between this edge and the fence. And then you need to figure out how wide your bit is that you're using so that you can determine how much more of it you need to cut off. I mean, it's, it's not <laughs> rocket science. It's not even really close, to be honest with you. It's just some really simple, general math. If you took a piece of paper and wrote down you need it this wide and drew a little diagram of seven eighths of an inch and then you have a three quarter inch router bit figure out how much space that takes up inside of the the piece and then figure out how wide you need to uh, to be able to run that how much further you need it and I've actually I don't even move the router bit on making a G or F sharp flute I just set it for what it's at right now and then I run it backwards after I run the first pass this way I run it backwards the other way but to answer everyone's question, what these markings are here is the size, it's the distance. Let me grab my caliper real quick. So the distance here, from the center of this bit to that first line, maybe if you push it over this way a little bit, you can see it like I am. The center of this bit to this first line is going to be how much wood I don't cut. That's my starting point. So when I push this blank down in just a second, I'm going to start it right there. And the bit's actually going to start up in here. Back in the old days, I didn't have this. I drew every single marking that you see up here, I drew on the blank. And I still do that on my walking stick flutes because... They're not set up the same way everything else is. They don't go by the same uh, system. But if you notice, I have a line here on my table and here, and that's the width that this bit here cuts. A lot of people also ask, why is it I always use a three-quarters inch bit to make something that's either three-quarters or larger? Why don't I buy the larger bit? There's a number of reasons. The primary reason is, you can only get up to a three-quarters inch bit in most of your hardware stores. In the United States here, we have Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace Hardware. Um, those hardware stores have the largest roundover, not roundover, excuse me, core box that they sell, which is what this is, or cove, or flute. It's been called a number of different bits, but a core box is what they call it today. Um, the largest one that they sell that is carbide, like this one is, is three-quarters of an inch wide or three-eighths of an inch radius, three-quarters of an inch in diameter. So I use that bit because if this breaks down or if it goes dull in the middle of my workday, I can run out to my local Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware and go pick another one up. It's better than having to wait a week or two weeks for one to ship from another country to arrive here that's the exact right size I need it to be which let me tell you something else the larger bits you put on this router the more dangerous it becomes if you see the shape of this middle finger here right there that's from using a very heavy duty bit one that cut out the size i needed it to cut not on a router it was on a table saw but it was a it was doing the same function that this is so i'm not recommending to use what we call a molding bit on a table saw that is not the way to make flutes. I've done it. I did it for years, but I don't recommend it. It was quick, but it's not what you need to do because it'll take that finger right off, or at least it did for me. There's a lot of vibration involved. Um, with regards to using a larger bit here, if you use a larger bit, number one, it's going to go dull faster. Number two, look under the table here. This is router in my lifetime. This is router number 15 or 18, somewhere around there, maybe 20. Um, it's been pretty good so far. I don't tax it as much as I used to because I have other ways of, of uh, doing this today and I have several jobs that are like designated for this router or this router instead of doing it all on one router. I don't like to change that bit out, which is another reason that I don't recommend using uh, large multiple size bits to make your inside of your flute. You can do just as fine, if not a better job in my opinion, because the smaller bit cuts faster and 
Once again, it's easy to replace. It actually doesn't even dull as quick on some levels because it cuts faster. If you cut slowly, things dull quickly. If you cut fast, as long as you don't burn uh, the wood or the bit, then it doesn't dull as quick. So there's a number of reasons. There's less vibration. It doesn't wear out my router as fast. If you use a large bit, it's going to wear your router out faster because it's, it's like if you were driving a stick shift, any of you have ever done that before, <laughs> not many of you, but if you were starting your car out in fifth gear instead of starting it out in first gear, uh, if you started your car in fifth gear, you would be really slow to take off. But if you slammed it into fifth gear and stepped on the gas as hard as you could, it's going to break something. And that's what happens with large bits. Uh, and there are flute makers out there that use them, I'm sure, but eventually I hope that they grow out of them or they obviously don't make that many flutes. Um, it's just easier and so much better, in my opinion, on so many different levels and safer, not that it's safe. I don't recommend any of you doing this, by the way. This is just crazy dangerous as I'll get out. Uh, you know, but, uh, That's my finger, by the way. I'm showing you my cut and not flipping you off. Uh, but uh, anyway, making flutes like this or with any kind of power tools can be very dangerous and you can get hurt and we all have gotten hurt doing this in the shop. So uh, having said that, now you know what's going on there. I'm about to show you the depth and then we're going to go ahead and make this blank and I'll show you what happens with it. But um, if you notice, like I say, the distance between here and here, the center of this bit, well actually it's not even the center that we're going to, it's, it's actually here, the width of the, of the router bit itself is where it's going to cut to. So it's going to make a blank that pretty much is from here to there. That's what this line is for. If you wanted a thicker mouthpiece area or for whatever reason you needed it to be thicker up there you would simply draw your line a little further down the road when i say it ain't rocket science i'm not kidding you could draw a line right here and you could start your cut over here instead in which case you just lengthened the head of your flute a little bit so you could do that you could even make a big thick piece of wood up here by doing that and it would give you the opportunity to majorly taper it down like you see in some of the original flutes and there's still flute makers today that make theirs like that the reason I don't make my flutes like that with a real tapered, real pointy mouthpiece is because people have a tendency of sticking that in their mouth and that makes the flute wet out. Uh, I have videos on wetting out and a lot of those um, talk about what happens when you stick something in your mouth and it causes a salivary reaction. So I avoid that. But anyway, we're going to route this. We're going to go down right here. We're going to travel along and we're going to stop right at this next line. We stop at that line because that's where the the length of travel that we have just made, which is from here to here, from this area to this area, that's the size of the open, um, as some people call it, the sack, which is just crazy uh, talk to me. But, but anyway, the, what other people, you know, they call it the slow air chamber. This is just the air chamber in here. When you blow through the mouthpiece of a Native American flute, it goes through the mouthpiece and it collects to a small degree in this air chamber. And then from there, uh, it crosses, goes up a little hole to the air supply hole, comes out, goes across a track, goes over a splitting edge of the flute, and then the vibration of the splitting edge causes it to make sound in the instrument. But I'm going to show you in kind of slow, uh, not necessarily time lapse, but I'm just going to take my time doing this, why it is that these markings are here and what they do. So let me go ahead and get started. I, I do need to make sure that I've got my depth set close. It doesn't have to be exactly. 1085, it looks like I was doing something else here. But 1085 is kind of like my, my really close. Let's see. One thing about routers you'll notice is when you clamp it down, sometimes it'll change the position of the, uh, the bit. So now, let's see, we've gone down a little bit. I'm going to go back up. I'd say it's not got to be exactly perfect, but uh, the closer the better, of course. Hey, look at that, right on the money. Not too, not too bad. Now, you do need to make sure that you zero out your your uh, depth gauge here to make sure it's right it's pretty close I usually don't have to mess with this one this uh, Wixie brand or Wixie or whatever their name is 
they've been pretty good. I've, I've had this one for a while now. Um, there are so many other ways that you can do this. You don't even have to use a digital gauge. You can actually um, use a piece of wood. Like you can take the end of a, of a piece of wood and make it one depth, check it to see if it's the thickness that you need it to be. Or you can go back in with your caliper and measure how deep it is, which is what you use this right here for, see if it's cut down deep enough. And then eventually you make yourself a guide using this. That is not as accurate as using the little digital gauge, which cost me about 30 bucks at the time that this video was made. That's about the price. Um, but uh, it's a way that you can do it. So you can figure out what your depth needed to be is. You can measure it. If you don't have a caliper, which you can buy these for a dollar or two for a plastic one, uh, you can make one. Or you can just simply use a ruler and push it down inside of your piece. You can cut um, a point on the end of your ruler and see what the depth is and uh, get it to as close as possible. So, if you'll watch me do this here for just a second. That's how wide the air track or the air channel is. stopping right here so that I have a little bit of extra wood on the end of it. Sorry for bumping the camera y'all. I just want to let you know that uh, this path that I've traveled here, that represents the inside of this guy right here. And if it looks like it's a little bit bigger, that's because center to center of this bit actually gives you three-eighths of an inch larger on each side. Okay? So this would be about the center of where the bit is. Likewise over here. That's why I put it up here so you can see where the lines are. It's about the center of where the bit hits right there and right there. And it put about three-eighths of an inch on either side because center bit is three-eighths inch wider on this side. So when you start cutting, it's cutting three-eighths over here. And this is all trial and error. I mean, you just figure this stuff out as you go. This side over here is three-eighths of an inch wide. So when I stopped at this line, it actually had already cut three-eighths of an inch into that. Now, as I promised, I told you, down on this end, I left from the edge of this bit, or this line right here, to this line right here. That's how wide this area is. The reason that is there is because after I round this over on my round over router table, I'm going to sand it on the lathe. Because honestly, after sanding thousands of flutes by hand on this belt on the belt sander, I've developed some incredible arthritis, and the lathe is actually a much better way and quicker and easier to sand it. Of course, if you use a round over bit on your router uh, table, which I'll show you one of those in just a second, but if you use that round over bit, it takes so much of the work out for you that you can just about sand it by hand if you have the right size roundover bit. Uh, and we do have multiple size roundovers that we use to round our flutes over. So if you notice right now, you see, and there's a little bit of scrap wood, you can see it poking up here because of, of the depth of my bit versus the bottom edge of this router, uh, the actual cutting part of the bit here. It used to be in the old days, they would make these a little bit deeper for the consumer models. Now, if you want the deeper ones, you've got to pay extra. And once again, I'm talking about buying this at Lowe's, Home Depot, and Ace Hardware, or whatever your local hardware is in the country that you're watching us in. Um, so these days, they try to make these bits more cost-effective by not adding so much extra metal on them, even though they do have all this extra area here that they could have easily backed it up with. So there is a small piece of wood up in there, and you got it exactly, like this right here, 10.85 millimeters there's going to be a little bit left over because it doesn't cut as deep as it used to if I had uh, wanted to make multiple passes this piece of wood wouldn't be up in there but once again I sand it off or burn it out it's it's easy but the thing I want you to notice is the width from here to there that width comes from the distance from this router bit to the fence so the distance between the edge of this router bit right here to the front of this fence here, that's how wide 
this area is right here to right there so keep that in mind that's what when I'm telling you I'm going to set this at a quarter of an inch that's where that quarter of an inch is right there the top piece if you'll notice is not that it's it's thicker it's not the same width it's actually about an eighth of an inch or so give or take uh, actually a couple millimeters thicker than that side is but I'm going to show you right now how it is that I have my G pattern set up because once again the G flute is a certain depth that I can actually create with this router bit on one pass. I don't recommend necessarily doing this in one pass. When you're in a hurry, you try to do everything in one one take instead of making multiple takes. That's why you all get to see some of my comedy sometimes. But uh, anyway, um, what I'm going to do right now goes against what the router manufacturer's handbook says to do. I'm not recommending it to do. It is exactly what I do, but I don't think it's necessarily the right thing to do. Now what I've done is I've cut this side, I cut this side of the wood between this edge of the bit and the fence. Just like I had originally cut this side of the wood between the edge and the fence, I cut this side between the edge and the fence. So now both sides are the same thickness. Uh, that does a, a pretty good job of centering my flute so that when I make two halves like this, they go back together and they both have the same thickness of wood on each side that's a good thing but at the same time what I was shooting for was making this in here 7 8 of an inch in diameter and right now it's incredibly close once I burn it and sand it it'll be 7 8 of an inch in diameter um, and then we actually burn it again or rather we actually sand it again we burn it once and sand it twice um, but uh, that's how I travel from one end to the other that's how I determine what the thickness of this is right here. It's between the edge of that bit and this line. And then if you add 3 8 of an inch to this side of this line and 3 8 of an inch to that side of this line, that tells you how large my air supply area is, or the sack if you want to call it that. <laughs> I always have to laugh. Um, but anyway, it also helps to determine uh, where in, in the, the size of this flat area, the partition if you would, is what we usually call it, the partition between the air supply and the actual flute body itself. That is determined right here. So when I travel so far, and I told you that this is going to be 3 8 of an inch on this side, this is where the actual channel starts here and then on this one likewise because I put it down the wood down so that the head of it's right there the air channel starts right here so we have the distance between here and here is the width between there and here um, it has to do with what it is that you think is the right size to, to do that so you can imagine the 3 8 of an inch on either side of my caliper and that's how we determine that size. Now, as far as the, the size of your partition, it's relative. It doesn't really matter so much. Uh, I've got videos on that. If you haven't seen it, go back and, and find that video because we have, like I said, videos on uh, what determines how large this partition needs to be. And it will also determine how large, how long your track is inside of the flute. It's really relative. It doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. I mean, there are people who say, a short track will respond more quickly and a long track will respond more slowly. That's not exactly true. It depends on the flute maker. It depends on how deep you cut that track, how you cut that track. We burn ours so they're quite slick inside and then we sand them with a little file. Um, and we, when we get done with that, we actually go back and oil and wax it. So it's got oil and wax on that track, which helps make it really nice and slick, but it's also charred, so there's no, no kind of fiber inside of it that's, that's not uh, been singed or cauterized. Um, it doesn't collect water there because it's been burnt. Well, like I said, 
a lot of reasons I do what it is that I do. But that's basically it in a nutshell on how to determine where you want to put your lines here on your bike back guard of your router table when you're making these. So it's personal preference, it really is. And, and there's a lot of trial and error involved. And like I say, you could do the math and figure out that this bit's this size and this is how large the radius is and how far I'm gonna to need to travel to get this. But what I was looking for when I did it was a thick enough area here that my, my mouthpiece is, is gonna have a little bit of distance for the, the uh, drill bit to go through so that I have a place to blow that's not you know weak around the mouthpiece. And then down here I need an area where I can lock it in with my lathe and then I'll cut that piece off when I'm done. So make it a little bit longer than what it is that you, you uh, need it to be so that you have room not only for mistakes but it's easier to take what off than it is to put it back on like my dad used to say. So uh, I hope this video has helped you out. I know it's a little lengthier than we probably thought it was going to be but I want to make sure you know what it is that I'm doing and why it is that I'm doing it because as I've told my uh, class here recently in one of my online classes, um, you know, it's uh, me. I might be Oz, but I'm not behind the curtain. I don't want to hide none of this stuff from y'all. The only reason I haven't showed you before is because it's kind of, it's so simple. You know, it's, it's just minorly critical in my opinion. But uh, for you guys, I want you to see from start to finish why it is that I do that. And I uh, wanted to let you know because I've had so many people ask me over the years. So once again, I hope you find some good information in this. If you haven't seen it yet, I do have a book available on making Native American flutes. I have a class I just mentioned, but my class is now going to become a free uh, online um, course. This is for flute players. I do have other classes that are coming up online um, that will be ways that you can advance your flute making or flute playing. And uh, a lot of them are going to be free, which is, you know, good for you all. And, kind of hard for me to find time sometimes but I, I promise you I will and uh, if you haven't yet like I say please visit our website our Instagram if you're not an Instagram type person go check it out anyway it won't hurt you uh, once again Charlie Montotoyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com hope to see you here again really soon y'all take care